Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. It's me again, Paul Woodatch. Here we are again for World War II TV. There's a lot happened in the 24 hours since my last show. It's I couldn't keep my eyes off what's happening in the USA. But let's forget all modern politics and go back and talk about what happened in World War II, where we it's um it's easier in some ways. So my guest tonight, I'm really looking forward to this show, Lee Mandel, who wrote an incredibly good book about the actor Sterling Hayden and his his wars his actual war and his war with himself, I suppose you'd call it really. So good evening, Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And first thing, how, what was your career before you started writing and how did you get to write a book about Sterling Hayden? Because he's not one of the absolute top Hollywood names these days, he should be. I think he should be better known, but how, tell us a bit about how you got to write about him. Well, just as far as my background, I'm a, a physician, an internal medicine specialist, an aviation medicine specialist, and I had a career in the United States Navy, and uh, uh, very enjoyable. I retired from the Navy about seven years ago, and I've always been interested in reading, theater, writing, and all that stuff like that, and um, <clears throat> when I, with my involvement with Sterling Hayden, I've always been a fan of his anyway. I, I really enjoyed his movies. And about oh, six years ago, whatever, there was a thing I was online at the uh, National Archives in Washington, D.C., just outside Washington. And they had just released the personnel records of several famous people who were in the OSS, and one was Sterling Hayden. So I downloaded the whole you know, pile of stuff there, and it was just fascinating because in that he had a narrative he wrote in November 1944 describing his experiences in the Balkan. Balkans, and I never knew much about the Balkans. It caused me to read a lot, if you will. And uh, next thing you know, I'm, I'm at the National Archives pulling his operational reports. And I was originally intending just to try and write a book on his World War II exploits, but he was so—he's such an interesting guy and such a multi-talented Renaissance-type guy. Um, I couldn't stop, so I ended up writing a whole biography, and that's how it came about. I mean, it reminded me. Of, of the, I did a show about the British comedian, actor, author Spike Milligan, who of course was friends with Pete Sellers. So there's the connection there with Dr. Strangelove, who was another true Renaissance man, you know, went through World War II and then did everything, wrote, wrote poetry. And, and, you know, there was things I learned about Sterling Hayden that I had no idea that he'd done so many things. And I mean, it's a cliche, but he lived, he lived in, uh, you know, a hundred lifetimes in, in one. Um, so let's, let's take it from the beginning, you know, and, you know, I, 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 I'm going to compare him a little bit to Audie Murphy, not in, I mean, in height difference, they couldn't be further apart. <laughs> Sterling Hayden, six foot five, Audie Murphy, about three foot nothing. But they both were, were, became Hollywood legends and they both had a war that was crippling in terms of, of their mental health. And yet it, it, it loomed large in their, in their careers. Um, the difference is Audie Murphy was a farm boy from Texas whose entire knowledge of the war would have been, I believe from his next door neighbor's son was a Marine Marine or something like that, but he hadn't traveled. He left there in Nephew's County. Sterling Hayden, before World War II is even, is even a, a thought, had already traveled the world. So let's run through a little bit about his backstory, where he came from and how he came to have, have done so many things in his in, you know, very, very, early years. He'd already been around the world. So run a little bit about his background for me. Sure. He, he was a child of the Depression. He had an education that stopped at the 10th grade, and he, in essence, went to sea when he was about 16 years old. And he was fascinated from his childhood with the visions of going to sea. He became such a prominent and, and accomplished sailor that he was first mate when he was 20 years old on an around-the-world voyage, which was actually became a uh, connection for him to William J. Donovan. And uh, when he was 22 years old, he was a captain of a vessel. He sailed from Boston to Tahiti with a crew of 11 people. He was the youngest one, 22 uh, years old. And he was starting to get noticed in a lot of these uh, sailing episodes because he was so handsome and so tall. And there was a, uh, a reporter who he was friends with, became a drinking buddy who, and convinced him, Sterling, you gotta go to Hollywood. He wrote away to an agent, this friend of his, and they got him a screen test. and. He felt like a fool doing it. He never liked being in front of the camera. He really, his first love was the sea and he would always come back to that. But he had been around the world several times. He had uh, uh, captain schooners and, and done all this kind of really accomplished stuff when he was in his late teens and early twenties. And he became an actor really by almost a fluke. You know, in my book, I covered that, but it's almost unbelievable. It's right out of a, a Hollywood cliche. 
but that's uh, how he, you know, his background was a worldwide traveler. And it seems he's that person that even falling into things accidentally, he becomes good at it very, very quickly. He's, he's, he's not there by accident. I mean, he, you know, as your book well, well uh, explains, you know, he's, 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 his first movie was the second male lead. His second movie, he was the male lead and he'd never right. had any acting experience. And there's people who had grafted away in Hollywood as extras for years, hoping to get the big break. And this six foot five sailor just walk, breezes in on a bit of luck because he knows someone and boom, he's, he's co-starring in a movie um, and, 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 and got a wife out of it as well. And I think it's time to bring in his, his, his first wife in this way, because Madeline Carroll was also, um, a, 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 at the time, a very famous actor, 10 years his senior. Yes. So explain um, her background, because she, she, was, she was English, wasn't she? Yes, yes. Uh, and, she was, I'm sorry, sorry, yeah. she, she was a, a British actress. She was highly educated, considered the most beautiful woman in Hollywood. And in fact, in, at those days, she was the highest paid actress in Hollywood. And when Hayden was offered the role, if you will, they said, we're gonna co-star you in a movie called Virginia, starring Madeline Carroll and Fred McMurray. And they said, however, she has casting uh, say over who gets cast, so you're gonna to have to meet her. Well, the two of them, here, there was two gorgeous people. They hit it off like mad and started an affair. And he started the movie with Fred McMurray. Next, they made a movie called Bahama Passage, where he was the male star, Madeline was the uh, co-star, but she also, like him, she was a free spirit. I mean, she literally, when the war started, her sister had been killed in one of the raids, you know, the German Blitz uh, over London. And she basically walked away from Hollywood too, like he actually did too, joined uh, the USO, joined the Red Cross and all that. But they were both very uh, kind of too different to be attracted to each other. They were 10 years age difference. She was highly educated, even though he was a really brilliant guy, he really didn't have much of a formal education. And it turns out from my research of the four years they were actually married, they were only together really about four or five months because of the war. Mm. And what's, you know, you say he's not educated in, in, a, in a conventional sense. And, and I think in my, my takeaway is that he was like a sponge for people yes. who'd had life experiences and things. And this, this plays into his story in many ways because of his you know, he, he was exposed to communism. He was explained the different ideas and political ideas and systems. And as you say, you know, captaining his own book, uh, boat at 22 years old around the world, he's going to seek cultures because harbors and port towns are notoriously where the all mixes of society are there, aren't they? You know, I mean, I can think of English ports. You know, if you want to experience all the types of life, Liverpool, famous port town where, you know, rock and roll was brought to England by Liverpool and the Beatles. That's right. where you understand the world. That's where you understand people is by traveling and going through these these communities of sailors. And and you know, and you, you, the fact he lost uh, Madeline lost her sister, that was probably the one of the things that 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 gets, gives him an understanding of what was happening in Europe. Because that's one of the interesting things that I find as a Brit is that we as Brits tend to kind of forget that there's this two year period when the USA is not involved in the war. And some of your country wants to get involved. Some are saying, let's not get involved. And there's a big sort of conflict going on in the country. Um, so how much of, of, of his experiences in traveling do you think was what pushed Berling to just walk away from this Hollywood career? Well, I think it was, you know, his, his desire, if you will, to be kind of a contributor to society. You know, he was already under the influence of several people who were, you know, basically communists, and had it enticed him with the thought that, look, you could do better with your life. You could be more con contributory. Plus, we have to not forget the fact that Sterling Hayden was a voracious reader. He read like mad, so he was very much self-educated. And I think when he, he felt stupid being an actor, I mean, he makes that clear in his autobiography that after the second movie, when you know they, they said, you're the newest star in Hollywood, he basically walked away. He felt like a fool and he wanted to you know, get out. And in fact, what he did, and this may lead into one of the topics we're going to get to, he actually went and got commando training in Scotland. I mean, he goes from Hollywood to volunteering for commando training in Scotland. Very unusual guy, to mm. say the least. I mean, it's not so much walking away from Hollywood. I mean, he had to kind of buy himself out, didn't he? Because he'd been put on a contract. I mean, this is the, 
this is not the era of today when actors can go from TV to, to, to movies. Right. They are signed up. You know, the MGM famously, you know, had these contracts and people like Judy Garland were committed and then put on drugs by their bosses and stuff. So, you know, if you're in a contract for seven movies over 10 years or something, just walking away from it is a big thing. And and so he he didn't just walk away. He 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 had to cripple himself financially because he was he'd made money and lost money already about five or six times before the war even starts, didn't it? I mean, he'd, he'd right. been through all sorts of financial escapades, but he had to kind of buy himself out of Hollywood. And this is where, and you mentioned it there, he'd been sailing with William Donovan's son, hadn't he? Right. Yes, and right. William Donovan, for those who don't know, William Donovan ended up becoming um, the, 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 the starter of OSS, essentially. And, it, and OSS became, um, evolved from various other, you know, government set up organizations. William Donovan, you know, a hugely influential figure in terms of spies and espionage. And, and so, but like the lucky break about getting to Hollywood, he just happened to know William Donovan's son. So run through the story of how he's, he's just, and it's, it's happening very quickly, he kind of left Hollywood and within like days, <laughs> he's on a boat for England, isn't he? So explain what happened and what exactly what role he was undertaking for Donovan. Cause at this point in the war, we, we run through the dates. The OSS hadn't actually become itself yet, had it? There, it was still oh. in, in flux. So explain what was going on, what William Donovan was trying to do, and why he thought Sterling Hayden would be useful in his plans. Yeah, well, Donovan was named by President Roosevelt. As his original title in the organization was the Coordinator of Information. Following year 1942, the name was changed to the OSS, the <coughs> Office of Strategic Services. And Hayden had somehow met, I don't know exactly how, but through Do uh, Donald, uh, David Donovan, his son, and also he had met Donovan's wife and daughter who also sailed with him. He contacted him and, and asked about uh, being arranged to go to Scotland, do commando training, because the United States was not in the war then. And um, he pulled strings, Donovan pulled strings to get him there. And he went to Scotland for several weeks where he went through, he was the only American there. Um, he went through commando training, parachute training, and came back and then he was sort of mustered out of the, uh, you know, he was offered an army commission as a result of this. But when the war broke out, you know, what Donovan's looking for, he's looking for, you know, people with phys physical people who's got army training, got maybe commando training, language abilities. And he was fairly fluent in French, uh, Sterling Hayden, uh, had parachute training and were also free spirits. Um, and Hayden fit the bill in that tremendously. So when he got out at the end of uh, his commando training, he was offered an army commission, turned it down. He started working for Elko uh, shipping company that built the PT boats and, and really enjoyed that. Tried to get a Navy commission. They offered him the rank of ensign, the lowest commission officer. <laughs> he felt a little insulted. He felt he should at least be a Lieutenant, but then in his autobiography, autobiography he reflected, well, I guess they don't give lieutenancies to guys with 10th grade educations. And he became a contractor sailing war supplies around the Caribbean for the United States government. And one day he's in Curacao, which coincidentally where my wife and I have spent our honeymoon. And he met six Marines off duty and they became drinking buddies and had a good old time. And they managed to get thrown in jail too, uh, tearing up a bar. He flew back to New York and to be with Madeline and announced the next day he's enlisting in the United States Marine Corps. And he did. And shall we proceed from there? Yeah, and, but you know, and let, let's just go back briefly to the to the, the parachute training with the British as well, because you know, e even in your book, you kind of not dismiss it. But this is in as a Brit who studied the SOE and what this is in the early years. I've done shows with Damien Lewis, where in the 41, 42 era, era, it was absolute renegades and pirates who were going through this kind of training. It was all you knew someone who knew someone else, and it was an old boy network of you know, adventurers and round the sea sail sailors and stuff. By 1944 in the Normandy era, the SAS and things like that are much more in line with regular army regiments. There's sort of a enlistment process. But the early years, it's just, you know, pirates coming in from nowhere. <laughs> and Sterling fulfilled that bill literally and metaphorically. You know, he had traveled around the world on so and you can just imagine, he, you know, he, the fact he dismisses the train. This is when they were experimenting. I mean, you've, you've got to understand, folks, when he's going through parachute training, the British only been doing it for about six months. It's, they're still learning how to do it. They're still adapting aircraft, how to do it. This is really the earliest era of men jumping out of aircraft. And he just sort of went through that, although he you know, had, a, had injuries doing so. 
And even just that alone, if that had been the only thing he'd been able to do and went back to Hollywood, that alone would earn him enough respect for me. But the fact he then goes in the Marine Corps, and this is where the, the difference is, he enlisted not under his own name this time, did he? When he was in, uh, in Britain for Donovan, he was there as Sterling Hayden. But in the Marine Corps, he enlists under a fake name, isn't it? So what was his reasoning for going under a fake name? Was he just kind of fed up with the Hollywood bullshit? He wanted to be treated differently? Yeah, he wanted to escape that persona. You know, when he first got to Paris Island, you know, they everyone knew who he was. I mean, the guy's tall, handsome, and he'd been a movie star. And they right from the, the get-go, they were sort of threatening him, sort of saying, you know, hey, you know, you ain't the big star here, blah, blah, blah. And um, he, he decided to change his name, as did uh, Madeline. They shortly thereafter changed the name to Hamilton. So for the rest of the war, he went through with the name of John Hamilton. But the, not the hilarious, but the funny part is wherever he was, everyone knew who he was. You know, like the men who served under him in the Balkans, they knew he was Sterling Hayden, but they don't dare call him, you know, Captain Hayden or something. He was always Captain Hamilton. That photo there that you're showing was taken by Madeline Carroll when he was finishing boot camp. And he really, he excelled in boot camp. He was the perfect recruit. And he was one of, uh, I think it was two in his uh, uh, boot camp class that was picked for officer candidate school. And he became an officer. And it was about that time when they said, when you graduate, you're going to be a training officer. He says, no, you know, this is a guy who sailed around the world, volunteered for commando training. And the last thing he wanted to do was be stuck at Quantico, Virginia. So he contacted William Donovan. And Donovan pulled strings to help get him into the OSS, which more fit Sterling's persona as a bit of a freewheeler and a free spirit. The um, uh, interesting, some of the correspondence I got from the National Archives, the first uh, round, if you will, when they were, he was trying to get into the OSS, the selection committee didn't pick him. And the, some, one of the executives wrote there said, and said, does the committee know that General Donovan is personally interested in this? Yeah. And what do you know, he got selected. And um, he began his career with the OSS. And this is this is that recognition by people like Donovan and others. And, you know, you put in your book various other reports by other people who, who come across Sterling Hayden. He's exactly what you want for what, you know, what we'll just call kind of unconventional war, warfare. He's He's got leadership ability. I mean, if he can captain a boat of des disparates at 22 around the world, then you can certainly lead men in, in combat. Well read. Um, six foot five, good looking. You know, you kind of you look at him, and you're just going to follow him into hell anyway well travel i mean he's exactly what they want and this is what this is where I, the, the Audi murphy parallel falls away a little bit because everything Audi murphy learned he learned within the, with the military he, he, he'd been a farm boy and he became a great leader and he got and he of course was received the medal of honor as a as a lieutenant but you know he, he'd had no worldly training before that sterling hayden brought this 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 quality of of travel and, it, and again in in 2021 terms we forget how many 20 year olds have traveled around the world these days. My own stepdaughters, 23 and 20, have been to more countries between than I have. But right. back then, back in World War II, your average farm boy from Kansas, your average city kid from Liverpool, had barely traveled to London, let alone across the world. So Sterling Hayden, for something like the OSS, OSS is a huge bonus. He's got that ability to just know things and know shit about the world. So he's. He's headhunted effectively, and he and so by by William Donovan for OSS, and and by now a few months have passed. The OSS has kind of a defined role now, and we're going to be talking about the Balkans now, aren't we? And and, right. and I find that's a particularly fascinating theory because it's so hard to understand exactly what's going on. I was going to tell the folks reading uh, watching this that not only when you buy Lee's book will you get a really good version of Sterling Hayden's life story. It's one of the best, if not the best, summary of the Yugoslavian political and military situation I think I've ever read because it is really crazily complicated. So run through, before we talk about Sterling Hayden's role, but for the benefit of the viewers, run through what was happening in Yugoslavia generally and why the OSS sure. and indeed the SOE were interested in what was going on there. Okay. Yugoslavia was overrun by the Nazis, I think it was in April 1941, and they took over what is now Serbia. And they took the, the state of Croatia and they assigned it, if you will, to the Ustasha, which is this murderous militant uh, uh, militia that was very pro-Nazi. And a hero emerged, if you will. Well, the king fled. King Peter fled to London, where he was the king in exile, but he had really no power. Well, a hero emerged, you know, that 
that the British and the Americans initially strongly supported a guy named Raza Mihailovic. He was a colonel in the army and he had a rebel army and they were getting a lot of good publicity and all that. But there was also another army called the Partisans led by Joseph Braz, who was known by his nom de guerre as Tito. And uh, they were basically a communist organization and the two were vying for power. Tito himself was a Croat and you know, the, the, the rivalry between Croats and Serbia, you know, that didn't help anything either. Well, what happened, the British started to notice that, hey, there's a little bit of difference here. The partisans, which were basically the communists, are actively engaging the Nazis. They're fighting, they're really you know, ferocious fighters and they're really taking it to them. Whereas Mihailovic, his people, they're husbanding their, their uh, resources. They're sort of like not engaging the Nazis. And it appeared that they were saving their supplies and all that for potential engagements against the partisans you know, in the future. So the, the uh, support from both the British and ultimately the Americans shifted over really more towards Tito. Now, uh, one of the things too to understand is that in the Balkans, the OSS was the junior partner, if you will. In 1941, Bill Donovan went to London and they hammered out what's called the London Accords, where between the SOE, the Special Operative, Exec um, Special Operative Executive, I believe is the British version of the OSS, mm -hmm. who uh, Winston Churchill said, basically your assignment is to set Europe ablaze. I like yeah, that. Yeah. And, uh, they hammered out who'd have their sphere of influence and who'd be the senior partner in which region. Well, the Balkans just happened to be the SOE, the British were the senior partner. And there was a lot of conflict between the OSS personnel and the SOE personnel. A lot of it was personalities. A lot of it was, you know, uh, what can you say? I mean, there was a lot of conflict in there. And Hayden, he arrived in uh, actually Barry, Italy, right, right when we uh, retook Italy and where the OSS set up their... Uh, um, station. And right at that time, they were running an, or, an operation called Operation Audrey, which you want me to go into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Operation Audrey was the brainchild of two of OSS agents who were already there by the name of Hans Tofte and Robert Thompson. And in it, basically, it was to take all the shipping they had and use that as a main supply route going from Barry, Italy to the Dalmatian coast of Yugoslavia, dropping off supplies and potentially picking up uh, injured partisans, injured uh, American downed airmen and stuff like that. Well, this guy named Lewis Hewitt, Major Hewitt was the guy who operationalized that. It's really interesting. He became very effective, but Hewitt had stepped on so many toes there. I mean, he says, General Eisenhower orders this, uh, you know, General Montgomery orders that. He was making stuff up. And he basically BS'd his way into this position of authority, which ultimately got him canned. I mean, when they sent the British um, uh, head of the British uh, uh, SOE to basically explain, look, we're the senior partner here. He told him to go, it begins with F, ends with a K, yeah, yeah, yeah. Himself, himself. And then finally, he took an unauthorized trip to partisan headquarters in Yugoslavia on the island of Viz, uh, promising Tito all this stuff like that. So he got canned. And Hayden worked with that. And what happened shortly after he got there, there was a, a, a ship was bombed that had gas on it and they had to evacuate the port. So Hayden was sent down to Monopoly, Italy, a few miles south, where he basically became in charge of the entire maritime operation. They ran, uh, at this point, they had mainly fishing schooners and fishing boats and sailboats. They ran about 70 missions back and forth between uh, the Dalmatian coast of Yugoslavia and Italy, bringing supplies and bringing back injured, uh, um, injured uh, partisans and all that. Very effective thing for which actually at the end of the war, Sterling got the uh, Silver Star Award to him for his actions there. But you know, there was a lot of, even within the, uh, S, the OSS station in Barry, there was a lot of dissension among them and Sterling almost got canned because of Hans Tofte's actions, which were really kind of uh, interesting. And, and what this ties into, and this is also kind of an interesting thing in November, 1943, there was a C-47 flying from Catania, Italy, to origin to Barry, Italy, and it had 12, no, 20, I'm sorry, it had 26 medical personnel, including 12 female nurses. Well, it hit a storm, got blown off course, ended up in Albania. They crash landed in Albania. And there was frantic efforts to rescue them. The uh, Albanian partisans were able to get them before the uh, pro-Nazi people did. And uh, the head of the uh, OSS in Barry, Italy, wanted to set a uh, rescue mission with a parachute in there. And it's interesting, you talk about the characters in the OSS. The guy who was supposed to lead this was Major Robert Weil. Robert Weil was heir to the Macy's fortune, was a lawyer, scholar and all, and he ends up in the OSS. 
Well, Tofty basically said, we need to take Hamilton, me or Sterling Hayden, which yeah. is really, of course, we need to take Hamilton there. And they said, no, we're not taking Hamilton. He basically went out of the chain of command and insist they take him. And so he got his butt chewed on that. But when Hayden came back from uh, uh, the island of Viz, he was sent there temporarily to fill in as the uh, um, uh, liaison to the partisans. Um, he got involved with Tofty. They said, we want a Tofty. Thompson and Hamilton, if you will, were called in and basically said, we want to be transferred out of the OSS. We don't believe in the mission anymore, Will. That got him canned, Tofty canned. Uh, Hamilton or Hayden, they took him aside. They said, Do you, did you really know this was going on? He really didn't. He said, he wasn't, he didn't ask me. He wasn't speaking for me. So he really wasn't in trouble. But Tofty got canned and the, ultimately other people took over Operation Audrey which ended shortly after that because it missed the, you know, the input and the drive of people like Sterling Hayden. Mm. I mean, and what's so fascinating, when we look at, you know, when you search, I mean, I, as I research this show, you look up Hollywood actors World War II, the same name has come up, you know, Clark Gable, his mission with the 8th Air Force, Jimmy Stewart, um, Eddie Albert was a um, landing craft commander, what have you. Um, and then you've got the other people at the bottom end who were just, I'm not saying just, but you get Lee Marvin, Tony Curtis, Peter Falk, who were Marines and Navy guys. But Sterling Hayden, and he was he was still very young. And by 43, he was only in his 20s, wasn't he? Yes, yes. You know, he, he's in a position of not just doing stuff. He's leading stuff. He is actually influencing things. And it, it, it strikes me is that part of it was just his sheer goddamn charisma out there. Because oh. the Yugoslavian situation, as you know, it goes into racism and, and genocides and, and hatred for, for, for the royalists. And it going back centuries. And of course, as we know, the war in Yugoslavia didn't end for another 50 years. It's still going on in Bosnia and stuff years later. So yeah. the only way you're going to survive in that kind of incredibly tense environment is just by having balls of steel and a big neck and, a, and just stand out there and do your own stuff and just get things done. And that's what I take away from your book is, you know, you said it there rather kind of glibly, a 70 plus missions. I mean, let's just stop for a second and think about this. <laughs> This is a guy in his 20s leading 70 plus supply missions across the Mediterranean to occupy Yugoslavia. I mean, this is incredible stuff. Um, and, but as I said to you before you went online, for those watching, even before I went on live, one of our viewers, Welsh1954, has already mentioned, ironically and weirdly, and you couldn't make this shit up, there was another what, who would become acting legend in Yugoslavia at the same time as Sterling Hayden in the OSE, SOE, in the rival organization. So this is when Anthony Quayle, now for those watching, Anthony Quayle was in Guns of Navarone, he was in Battle of River Plate, I watched last week over Christmas, you know, Shakespearean actor, I mean, couldn't be more different to Sterling Hayden in terms of background and, and, and upbringing and, 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 you know, but they were both well-traveled people. And Anthony Quayle writes in, in his autobiography of the same events that Sterling Hayden wrote, writes about and you write about, and yet they write about these events very, very differently. And this is, this is I, as soon as I read that, I was fascinated by the chapter there because it all comes down to this rescue mission, isn't it? And, and how, it, how it, it went in a way that Anthony Quayle basically blame Sterling Hayden for, for, um, for, for faith. So run through what the details and why there was this, this contradiction of how they remembered it. After um, Operation Audrey ended, uh, Sterling was sort of assigned for several months to run supplies and pick up, you know, uh, downed airmen and Italian POWs, they call them scarecrows because they hung around the uh, SOE headquarters there uh, to bring them back to Italy. And he did about 10 missions running uh, supplies back and forth there. Well, on one mission, first of all, in his autobiography, he just uses one line where he sort of says, and then I went to uh, 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 Albania for a while. And you know, he really doesn't go into much detail there, though later he told an anecdote. But the story is, uh, in, if you look at the November 1944 narrative that's in his file, that's where I got a lot of this information. He describes it and what he says, they got there to, bring supplies in and they were gonna evacuate these Italian POWs. And they had to, they're running against the tide and, and also the moon, you know, so, so that the moonlight isn't giving them away and all. And they told the British, look, we need to get these guys here fast. Well, they got one boat out there 
And then nothing was happening. So Sterling went in there and said, well, what's going on? There were no British you know, officers there, or British personnel. And they said, well, they're up there. So he allegedly he called, he didn't know who the guy was, but it was Anthony Quayle. Obviously he wrote this in 1944. And the guy said, I'm too busy to come on down. So several of the people drowned trying to get out there and they had to leave several out. And Sterling went to the Albanian desk back at Barry for the uh, OSS and made a complaint. He says, you know, if they're not gonna cooperate, we don't need to do this. Well, Anthony Quayle, in his memory, he says they were anchored so far out that they had to row their boats out to get the supplies and they're throwing it down on them. And he kept saying, bring the boat closer in, it's safer. So finally, he, uh, Quayle called over and said, please send your CO in there. Well, Eden comes in there and said, what's the problem? And he goes, you need to bring the boat closer in. And they, according to Quayle, Hayden said, look, I'm the commander here. We're not bringing the boat in and get this stuff out there. Well, again, Quayle notified, knows that three people drowned trying to get out there. And what he claims is that there were 60 Italian prisoners who never got out to Sterling's boat because he wouldn't bring it in. And they later got taken prisoners by the Nazis. Well, the interesting thing about that, and I covered both of this mm. in the book, uh, Nick Kukic, who was a gunnery sergeant who was the assistant to Anthony Quayle from the OSS. He says, look, he says, Hayden describes a thing later in the book where 30 uh, uh, of these people are prisoners or machine gunned to death. He says, I don't think that ever happened. And then he also said, Anthony Quayle, I think is confusing it because there are two, he's combining two episodes with one. So, you know, whose memory is exactly correct? It's hard to say. And, you know, these are, these guys were both heroes, Quayle and Hayden, without a doubt. Absolutely. But, um, we're not, we're yeah, not but, casting any aspersions here. We're not, we're just saying this is the fog of war, literally and figuratively yes. again. And, and, you know, and Anthony Quayle wrote his autobiography, 40, 30 years ago or something now. And at the time he wrote it, there was less information about the SOE. There was, still, you know, you couldn't get these files out of the public records right. office in Britain. Right. And you, at that point, you can now. Um, I, I'm actually trying to work on someone who can come on and do a show for me about Anthony Quayle's work experience, because I think it would make a nice um, yeah. a companion to this show, given that they were in the same place at the same time. But it just does bring up, we've had it on numerous shows before this contradiction of personal accounts is always going to be fascinating there was a big twitter debate today about when can you trust you know veterans memoirs and if they write them immediately after all is that more accurate than one written 30 years later who are they writing it for what's the audience what are they trying to deal with and it it doesn't matter as you said yourself they were both they were both there doing a job and you yeah. know and and they have their points of view as a, as a, you get it in normandy there may be a senior officer leading infantry inside a boat, but the boat is under the command of the commander of the boat until it fulfills its mission of getting men to the beach. So you have these conflicts of command of the guy, you know, you get the same with the air crews for D-Day, the C-47 pilots can't slow down because under fire, the guys in the back say, why aren't you going? It, they're, they're, they're experiencing different versions of the same story yeah. and their perspective is going to be different. And it's, it, it's just, that's what makes it fascinating. Um, but what? Um, thank you for explaining that backstory there. But during this time, but during the whole Yugoslavia phase, the other thing that's interesting is Hollywood kind of nearly rears its way in again because Sterling has the idea of making a movie about what the communists are doing in Yugoslavia. So th that never happened, by the way, folks. So don't be googling for the movie. But <laughs> explain, um, Lee, what what must have happened to Sterling seeing what was going on in Yugoslavia and how it affected him and why he wanted to, uh, to do something about, to, about telling this story. Yeah, Sterling was so impressed with the uh, Yugoslavian partisans that he worked with in Barry, loading the ships and going on missions with him, stuff like that. And he was very much taken with their patriotism, with their humanity and all that stuff like that. Well, you know, when he, one of the interesting things is on one of his missions, uh, oh, wait, let me get back to the movie. Yeah. So he decided to write a screenplay for a movie. And I saw this referenced in one of the, the history books I had. So when I was at the National Archives, I actually got the screenplay. It's 11 pages long. It's called The People Fight. And he got permission to write it. And they were going to considering film it, filming it, by, but they never did. But in it, you know, he was supposed to show, A, the role of the United States and the OSS uh, uh, helping the partisans. And the movie, he, he never mentions the OSS. And he just mentioned the United States one time under the guise of the Allies did this. And it really was kind of a, it's a both bizarre thing, but it was also very hokey, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the World War II movies were sort of propaganda type 
stuff. And this was sort of like that. And I could see why they never filmed the thing. Um, it really, it, you could see it was written by someone who knew something about screenplays and settings and stuff like that. But it was basically a, a, a tribute to the partisans and it made it sound like they were winning the war by themselves and kind of interesting. If I could divert to just two quick anecdotes about him as a leader. Um, I covered this in the book, they worshiped him. They said he was the best sailor they've ever worked with. He was intense. And he would be at the end of every mission brief, you know, before they'd leave, they'd have a briefing. He'd always end it with the phrase, take care of the goddamn boat and you'll protect your own ass, you know, which I thought was kind of a, kind of a cool thing. Well, they were out on one mission. They were coming back <clears throat> and they had wounded American airmen on them, on the boat. And they got attacked by a German e-boat and Sterling was able to outmaneuver them. And he called over on open frequency to you know to the headquarters and to the British said look send someone out there we're under heavy attack and they responded no can, can, cannot do sorry and that really infuriated him so when they got back near the port a British PT boat was passing by and he ordered his men to open fire on them and they said why there's an open fire and they shot at it they, they shot above it but they actually did hit the windshield well, the British arrested the entire crew and they all of them insisted we never got any orders to do this we're not certain where these bullets came from, and as I said, we were protecting Captain Hamilton because we, he was really the best seal we had. Another quickie is the uh, same scenario was coming back from the Dalmatian coast of Yugoslavia. And as they're approaching, they got two severely wounded men there. They set up flares to indicate they needed ambulances right at the pier. And he looks and as they're pulling in and set up differently, he gets there, there's a woman standing at the pier and everyone goes, oh my God, it's Madeline Carroll. She was in Italy. Uh, working for the both USO and the Red Cross and all, and the publicist for the army said, this would be a great idea if we had them have a reunion at the pier side. Of course, he picked the wrong time to do this. So they pulled into the pier and Hayden just unloaded with profanity, said, get everyone out of here and all this stuff like that. And he made sure his men were taken care of. And they started yelling at Madeline Carroll. She ran off there and all, and all that. And so this officer who was in charge of this whole project, who was like two ranks senior to Sterling, came up to him. Hayden grabbed him and threw him into the harbor. I thought that was hilarious. But again, he had this knack of, of getting people to follow him in, with heroic stuff like that. And yet he'd never get into a lot of trouble per se, even when he was in trouble. I, I could never figure that one out, but just maybe it was part of his personality. He seemed to instill loyalty in those around him. That, you know, yes, he, you know, he, he, he tells the crew to shoot at the British boat and then they cover his ass when they're, when, when yes, they're they on do. the line. And that's that. You, you can't buy that kind of respect. You either have that or you don't. And in me as a Brit, you know, I was reading the book and I was laughing away, you know, he's shooting at a British boat because I have no problem with an American having a go at the British if it's justified. And the fact is, you know, in that situation, he felt this, they'd been let down a bit, so he fired over their heads. So I've got no yeah. problem with that at all. There's a guy standing up for what he believes in. And it's this idea, you know, we'll, we'll discuss later in the show this, because you know, communism and the Communist Party kind of looms life in it, large in his life, and but he'd been there. He'd seen he'd seen communist partisans fighting for a cause. So it's very different having an opinion about communism when you've seen some aspect of it than if you haven't. And you know, it's like you know when I have a, get into political arguments with my American friends about socialism. I live in France, which is a largely socialist country. The roads are great, the schools are great. You know, so I have a different view of socialism. Socialism, socialism I can't even say it. Because I have my friends who've never lived within it. You've got to travel. You've got to understand and embrace. And that is, you know, we said at the top of the show, Sterling Hayden is a Renaissance man who had been around the world and seen a bit and understood it and lived it, and lived in it there. So anyway, the, yeah, the, 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 the Pierce side incident with his wife was, was hilarious in the book. Um, but he, the, the role in the Balkans came to an end because it all starts unraveling between SOE and OSS as well there and the situation changing politically as well. So he, he's, his career there kind of winds down a little bit. What was his next, his next task with the OSS? Well, after that, those incidents there in Albania, you know, he got leave back home and then he was reassigned as a, the OSS intel officer for the first U.S. Army in Belgium. And he flew out there, a, a funny incident on his way out to uh, Belgium. He's in Paris and he decides to call Madeline. You know, he hadn't seen her in a long time and she was living in an apartment. There. He calls her and uh, a man answers. And he says, I'd like to speak to Madeline Carroll. And he goes, who's calling? And Sturgeon goes, well, who are you? And he goes, General Dwight Eisenhower. 
and he hung up the phone. And when I when he told that story on his deathbed, actually to one of his friends, and I thought that was interesting. But did that really happen? Well, I looked it up, and uh, actually, General Eisenhower was in Paris that time. There was good friends with Madeleine Carroll. Often dined with her. Yeah, that probably probably did answer the phone. I thought that was great. But he got to. Uh, uh, Belgium and the head of the uh, the G2, the head of Intel for the first time was a guy named Colonel uh, Benjamin Dixon. And when Sterling reported in, he goes, oh, let me guess, you're OSS, you're one of uh, uh, Donovan's beagles. He said, well, I can tell you, Hitler ain't here if you're looking for him. And they actually got along quite well. And they were uh, the first night that the whole Intel division, uh, the hierarchy is drinking together, having cognac. And uh, Dixon starting to, you know, kind of tweak Sterling in good nature and Sterling took it good nature. He says, you know, these OS guy, OSS guys are amazing. You know, they parachute into Sicily one day, then they're dancing on the roof at the, at the St. Regis the next day. And you know what? None of this has a goddamn thing to do with the war. I thought that was funny. And Sterling actually, his last assignment, he had two assignments actually. One was to look for genuine anti-Nazis. I'm not certain what the what they were planning on doing as a result of that. And one thing that disgusted Sterling, he says, I never met one person in the old Germany who was pro-Nazi. They were all opposed to Nazis. He said, oh, what a bunch of crap. And then his last assignment, he and his photographic crew uh, photographed a bunch of bases around Germany, Denmark, and Norway uh, for bomb damage and all that. And finally, the fall of uh, 1945, he had enough points to come home. And I think he was officially released from the Marine Corps just around Christmas Day, 1945. And shortly after that, he was awarded the Silver Star for his actions in the Balkans. Quite a, quite an I mean, it's quite a career, and and also it struck me again reading your book is that as great as he'd been at his role in the war, he was not destined to be able to carry on with the civilian aspect of the set because he's too much of a maverick, isn't he? He wasn't going yes. to adjust very well to the much more formulated, regulated CIA of the post-war era. You know, he, 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 and you see that a lot with some of these kind of LRDG SAS kind of guys. They're they're. You know, they're the kind of guys you, I always joke that you kind of want them, you know, to if if in danger, break glass, release. But as soon as peace comes, you don't you don't want them around anymore. You want to get rid of them quickly because they're renegades. And yeah, so well, uh, and a, a lot of the uh, OSS guys were like Sterling individualists. You know, they yeah, they're they're they're, 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 they're they're by nature individuals, which is great in a war environment. But after war, you know, it's the it's the, the brown nosers kind of prosper, the guys who know how to do the filing and, and order organize filing cabinet. They're the ones, and not Jen, not always, but they're the ones who seem to prosper in those in front. So after this incredible career, you know, Percy decorated by Tito, he came across all this sort of thing. He ends up kind of back in back in Hollywood again, or rather there's a and his marriage fails. You know, the, the first marriage to Madeline ends, as you said, in four years of marriage, only four months together. So and the age gap and the and the, the difference of opinion, this they just distance and time and trauma, so I guess, split them up. So was it immediately back into Hollywood or was there a sort of another sort of sojourn in between? It was pretty, pretty quick back into Hollywood, you know, because obviously he didn't have a job and they wanted him. Paramount Pictures approached him and re-signed him and he made a nice living, even though he really didn't, uh, you know, if you will, work that hard. And he filmed a few movies, none of which were, you know, spectacular until he did The Asphalt Jungle. But also he got involved with the Communist Party. This is interesting. You know, he had a mentor, if you will. He, in the book, I, you know, I mentioned mm. several of his mentors. And one was this guy, Warwick Tompkins, who was a communist and, and tried to indoctrinate, if you will, Sterling to, you know, you should become one of us, make the world better. And Sterling felt that, you know, working with the partisans on the peers at Barry and all, he had met the right people. And maybe I can make a, you know, maybe my, my life has a purpose now. And uh, he joined the Com Communist Party for about six months, he was approached by one of the um, uh, starlets to join, and he did, and he quit at the end of six months. And, you know, people would ask him, why did he quit, you know, after he was so gung-ho? Well, you know, after the excitement of World War II, after the meaningful preserving freedom, fighting the Nazis and all, and somehow working uh, uh, to make coffee breaks longer for Hollywood stagehand, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, mm. didn't have the same quite meaning there. And also, too, he was a little disillusioned. This, I was really surprised when I found this. Um, you know, in his narrative in 1944, um, he writes very positively about the partisans and, and in the, his book, Wanderers, sort of biography, the same thing. When I got his files from the uh, National Archives, his post-mission report after one, he, he did one of these things called the Air Crew Rescue Unit. Uh, they parachuted into Yugoslavia to rescue airmen. It was the first time he worked 
hand in hand with the actual Yugoslavian communist army, if you will. And he was totally disgusted. He says, these aren't the same people. He says, these people would sell you out for a nickel. You know, when the people, the Nazis come in the village, they flee and let the, the village take the, all the uh, bad stuff. He was very disenchanted. In fact, it was such a surprising turnaround that his commanding officer folded up to Washington and said, you know, for a guy like Sterling Hayden, who's, who's really a you know, solid citizen, for him to have such a change of heart. And he wasn't the only one either. There was others who came to the same conclusion. And Sterling in, his, in this report said, if we think we accomplished something in Yugoslavia, we're kidding ourselves. There's going to be war going on there for years, as he, yeah. as he was proved to be right. But when he quit the Communist Party after six months, it would come back and haunt him, uh, particularly during the UAC, you know, the House Un-American Activities Committee hearings. And um, just when his career was taking off with the Asphalt Jungle, which is a you know, classic movie, uh, he got subpoenaed. Now, he went to... Uh, uh, a psychiatrist, and actually wasn't really a psychiatrist, it was a psychologist who was approved by the Communist Party, if you will, they didn't believe in psychology, a guy named the name of Philip Cohen, and he had a lot of Hollywood stars like Lloyd Bridges as his patients, and he was also tied into this big name attorney, Martin Gag. Well, they would arrange, if you will, for their clients, if they did get called in front of the committee, how they should handle it, and basically they said, cooperate, name some names, uh, don't worry about it. Your career will be safe. And, and one thing that Martin Gang always said, too, they already have the names. And I was very surprised when I was reading. Yeah, they had the names. You know, they knew who exactly who were members of the Communist Party at one time or another. It's just they wanted to hear it come out of the mouth, if you will, of a celebrity. So Sterling was the one back in 1951. Yeah, and, and this, this coincides. And we don't want to kind of dwell on the, the, the demons, but you know, your book is titled Sterling Hayden's Wars. And as I said at the top of the show, there's the, the actual physical real war against Martin. There's the war, and I guess he's, he was his own worst enemy. And, yeah. and, and alcohol and, and problems of PTSD, which we'll touch on in a minute, and this guilt over getting involved in the Communist Party out of, out of a sense of idealism, I guess, and uh, wanting to make the world a better place. And he'd been in, been part of something that had, at the time, felt like it was changing the world, then comes back, the world hasn't got much better, and he's caught up in this cynicism, and he doesn't really enjoy being an actor. And and it all starts unraveling. And yet, during this time, he did make some incredible um, oh, yeah. films. Um, and, uh, you know, although this the World War II aspect of this, that is the show that's important, but I mean, just in terms of World War II films, The Eternal Sea is, is an incredibly good movie, which holds up very well today. Um, uh, and, you know, and we can't have a show without mentioning Dr. Strangelove, which is, is kind of a water movie. I mean, it's a Cold War satire, Stanley Kubrick. And we said before going online, I mean, you, I'm sure everyone watching this has seen uh, Dr. Strangelove. Um, and Peter Sellers gets all the plaudits and all the, all the credit for it, and George C. Scott. But to me, the, the st absolute standout role in that film is Sterling Hayden as General Ripper, because he makes that character so believable. And maybe there's, there's some of the real Sterling Hayden beside in that, that, that guy who'd been through war, and, and I don't know, but it's just an incredibly powerful performance. And the bodily fluid speech with Peter Sellers is still cracks me up. It's still a brilliant shot, and then and picking up the and then while he's talking, he's loading up the Browning 30 caliber again, ready to fire at the window. Incredible, incredible uh, performance. So, um, let let let's talk about the decline because um, you do you 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 examine it a little bit, but you're as a biographer, you're very fair, and you know it needs to be said. You had the backing of his family and his last wife and his sons and what have you but you don't pull him apart any more than he was doing himself. But what, what was happening to him kind of mentally during that period? Well, he, you know, during the war years, he was becoming an, a highly functional alcoholic, which basically he remained an alcoholic that he freely admitted for the rest of his life. He'd have periods of sobriety and periods where he'd go into rehab and all that. Interestingly, in 1968, yeah, a friend said, you know what you ought to try? You ought to try a hashish or marijuana. <laughs> and gave him a little uh, stash of marijuana. And he became a regular smoker, if you will, of marijuana the rest of his life. Um, he really changed his priorities. You know, he went through a horrendous second marriage. They had four children together and it turned out to be nothing but a slugging match against each other. It was Betty Ann, Betty Ann Danoon. And uh, finally in the course of, he got custody of the children um, at the end of the divorce. And one of the more famous things that you know, people associate Sterling Hayden for in 1958, 59, he was going to 
take the children on his schooner Wanderer, take them to Scandinavia and film sort of like a Swiss family Robinson type of stuff. But his wife got a court order uh, preventing him from taking the children out of the country. So he thought he was defeated, but uh, if you knew Sterling Hayden, he wasn't defeated. He had a volunteer crew of which I don't think any of them had any sea experience. Oh, his first mate had sea experience. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to actually interview uh, the youngest member of the crew, uh, Dennis Powers, who's still a, f a film producer now. And he told his crew, he says, look, you know, we, it looks like we lost. We're going to sail down to Santa Barbara and drop my kids off. Well, they pulled out of the 12 mile limit and he says, guess what? Change of plans. We're going to Tahiti. And basically he took the kids out defying the court order and uh, became a fugitive from American justice, if you will, and spent a year in Tahiti and came back and sort of got a slap on the wrist. The judge, you know, said, you know, suspended sentence. He got fined by the studio that he didn't produce a uh, film that he promised. But this was Sterling's, you know, modus operandi. You know, he was always in debt, but he didn't mind. And luckily his wife, Kitty, his uh, third wife, she was the financially responsible one. And she managed finances and kept the family afloat. She was the best thing really that ever happened to him. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know, and and he 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 had some other career high highs. I mean, you know, the, again, people watching this, you know, he was famously shot in the head by Al Pacino in The Godfather when Al, oh. Al Pacino goes in, Michael Collins goes into the toilet to get the the revolver hidden behind the system and goes back out, and a great death scene, and um and and kill and there and 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 gave a, a believability to all his roles. Or yeah, he never looked like he was enjoying it, did he? He. He, and he, you know, I, I, I trawled through YouTube trying to find appearances on chat shows, and there weren't any. You know, you see loads of Jimmy Stewart appears on Johnny Carson. Here's Jimmy Stewart, uh, you know, talking with wonderful wit about. There's very little. Sterling Hayden was a very clearly a very private individual who was battling his demons, things like that. And you know, what as someone, you know, you, you know, you served your country in the in the U.S. Navy, and you know, have you come across people in your own career that kind of sterling hayden reminds you of i mean someone who has been beaten by the by his experiences and is, 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 yeah well you know at the beginning of my navy career which was in the uh, late very late 70s early 80s there were still a lot of vietnam veterans on active duty and yeah i met some of them in there I may mean, i mention to you too one of my favorite patients was admiral john bulkley you know, the famous pt com boat commander from world war ii and uh uh, became his personal physician, and uh, some of the stories he would tell were really quite interesting, quite anecdotal, and uh, interesting too. He told me some stories, and when I asked his son about, it, I said, "He described this. This is did it actually happen this way?" He said, "Well, you got to understand, as you get older, the stories they are all true, but they get a little grandiose and a little bit more detailed, yeah. sort of like going back with with um, yeah. Anthony Quayle and versus Hayden, those type of stuff." But um, Oh, I was going to make a point, and I just slipped my mind. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> I mean, let, let, we'll we'll wrap things up. I've, I've I've really thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, Lee. And I mean, and for those who are not completely familiar with Sterling Hayden's life, I mean, I absolutely thoroughly endorse, endorse this book. I, I I read it in about three. One of those ones I read in about two or three days. Just this rip through it. I really enjoyed it. I'm a big film fan and a World War II fan, and and it was just it fulfilled all the all the things I require, I needed of a book. And uh, it, 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 it's always good to understand someone or try and understand someone's motivation for going off and serving their country and for what they did and, and understanding also, as we've discussed, how it can also break people. You know, we celebrate Audie Murphy. Again, we celebrate what he achieved, but we also need to examine what it did to him and the guy ends up an alcoholic. And it's war can, can be... Uh, 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 bring out the best in people and also destroy them at the same time. And, and Sterling Hayden is a, is a victim of the war as well as being a hero of it, I think. Um, and so, yeah, any, any, for those who, who haven't yet discovered Sterling Hayden's films, you mentioned the yeah, Asphalt Jungle, uh, we've done Dr. Stray. Any other couple of films people can watch out there that, that you recommend? Well, have any idea of his personality? Sure. Everyone has seen The Godfather. You know, people, when I was writing the book, they'd say, Who's Sterling Hayden? Never heard of him. I said, you've seen him. No, I haven't. I said, did you see The Godfather? Yeah. I said, he was the police chief. Oh, yeah. I, know. I would highly recommend The Killing. Yeah. Um, 1956, I believe that was. And of course, um, the, the Eternal Sea was one of my favorite uh, Sterling Hayden movies. The uh, Long Goodbye with Elliot Gould made 1973, I think it was. He gave a great performance in that. And also, 
one of his last filmed appearances for a TV miniseries, The Blue and the Gray, where he portrayed John Brown. And boy, did he nail that. He looked like John Brown. He talked with that deep voice note and gave a brilliant speech, you know, when uh, he was allowed to testify for himself. And then at the very end of this episode, he, they put him up on the gallows and they're about to put the rope around his neck. And I remember that deep, booming voice. He, a man couldn't ask for a more beautiful day. I mean, it was a great performance. I it's, had someone mention that to me on Twitter today when I met when I was advertising the show. Someone said that that was a the, 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 they were they watched. I think I think they said they were actually watching it being filmed or something. But that that was the the, the role they remember. So anyway, we could go round and round the houses talking about just talking about classic movies. But it's beyond the remit of the show. But um, are you going to be tackling anything with regards to World War II? Any future future books? I know you're enjoying your retirement, but you know your uh, your analytical approach deserves another subject. I think I know you've written about Kennedy and JFK's illnesses, but are you going to go back into World War II in any shape or form? Do you think? I'd like to. I, you know, one of the things I I just finished. You know, not that this may be a project. I just finished Lord Lovett's uh, memoir. Oh, no, right. Mike yes. Rose. I don't know if you've had any shows on him, but uh, I haven't yet. No, my, my, one of my friends here, who does shows with Colin, he, he's he's encountered. I met I met Lord Love a few years ago, and I and the current Simon Fraser has right. tour with my friend, and yeah, he's uh, he's another one who his version of things doesn't always tally with the versions of the events. Of, you know, Bill Millin, Lovett's Piper, I knew quite well, right. and Bill would say he got to roll his eyes. He had Lovett's verse. He loved Lord Lovett, but <laughs> Lovett was a Show me, in fact, the Pegasus Bridge story because Lovett arrives with commandos on D on Sword Beach from from Dida, and the, the version that some of the paratroop and glider guys say that is that there were there were two crossings of the bridge, one the first one, the second one for the cameras. It doesn't surprise me at all that Lovett insisted on doing it a second time. Hang on, now cameras, now we'll do it again. That's exactly that kind of showman there. But anyway. I've enjoyed talking to you, Lee. Um, I, if, you, if you do anything else World War II, I'd love to have you back on again because, you know, you, you, it was a, people enjoyed it. The comments coming on YouTube, they've, they've enjoyed the show, so I can't ask for anything more. In terms of those watching, we're going back to Hollywood tomorrow. Robert Manson is joining me slightly earlier, 6 p.m. UK time tomorrow, talking about Audrey Hepburn in World War II, another a fascinating story. She was there as an assistant nurse in the Battle of Arnhem. Her father was on one side of the... Politics, a mother on the other side, fascinating story there. And ended up in Breakfast at Tiffany's with Mickey Rooney doing a really bad Japanese. Anyway, we're going on, off on a tangent there. But join me for that tomorrow. I've got loads more shows coming up next week. But it remains me to say thank you very much, Lee, for joining us. Uh, you, you can find Lee's book on Amazon and all the other uh, book providers. And, and it's well worth a read. Um, don't forget to check, uh, click subscribe and click the little bell to get the notifications. Please check out our Patreon page and join up with us so you can find out what we're doing on World War II TV. And uh, other than that, I will see you all again tomorrow uh, for the Audrey Hepburn show. This is Paul Woodadge for World War II TV. Good night, Lee. Good night, everybody. I'll see you all no, again. Paul, thank you.